Rod Ellingworth, can you tell us something we don't know about Simon Yates? I don't know them that well, but what I do remember was they must have been sort of schoolboy age or early junior age. I remember seeing them on Manchester track doing track league. They both reminded me very much of Ben Swift because Swifty was also, you know, a real little tiny guy and the bike always looked too big for them. But what I do remember was, you know, they had that movement. You could see they clearly liked Swifty, didn't perhaps have the power back then, but they sort of they had that movement and vision on the track. You could see something about them, you know. So when, you know, Simon went on then to be part of the academy team and world points race champion I wasn't surprised but I think that's what makes him quite unique to other GC riders is he's you know he's got that speed he's got that top end and I think that's what will set him apart differently here is I think you may find a stage like today he will win the the group finish because he's got that top end where a lot of the GC guys don't have that quite unique really yeah now I wonder if I can tell you something they're twin brothers um (laughs) Are they twins? Well, yeah, but they're fraternal twins, not okay. identical twins. Okay, yeah, right, okay, didn't know that. Do you know the difference? Nope. We might have to cut to our embryologist here. <laughs> yes, here for you, Lionel. Identical or monozygotic twins develop from one egg, which splits to form two embryos, so the babies look the same. And fraternal or dizygotic twins develop from two different eggs, having two babies that look very much different. Chris Hill Jensen. Tell us something we don't know about Simon Yates. Impossible question to ask me. He likes a good lion. He's typically the last to come down for breakfast. Did you know that he likes video games and Indian food? Indian food is a must with the Yates brothers, that's for sure. Adam and Simon have ticked off as many Indian restaurants as they possibly can in all the countries they've been in. Have you ever been for a curry with them? A bit afraid, actually. I don't think my bowels can handle it. But George Bennett, tell me something I don't know about Simon Yates. Last week he got back from a training ride about 8pm in Andorra <laughs> and you saw him or he told you I was asleep my girlfriend was going down uh, going shopping and she said I just saw Yatesy and I looked at the time it was about 7.30 or something and he was going up about 2,500 metres of altitude so uh, he either does massive days or he starts late <laughs> and did you know that he was a former points race world champion on the track Yatesy on what points race I didn't but it doesn't surprise me the way I saw him kick off on Etna you don't do that with a uh, with an RPM of 80 like I've got. So, <laughs> Alex Dowsett, can you tell us anything we might not know about Simon Yates? <laughs> a little sod pipped me in a devil at track league once. I remember he was a junior, we were under 23s. I was riding a devil from the back, so trying to just make sure there's always someone behind me, and he popped round me at the last minute, put his bike in front of me on the line, looked at me and smiled. I was like, you little shit. <laughs> back then, didn't expect him to go down the climbing route because he was such a talent on the track. Did you know that his first big road win was in the Tour of Britain in 2013 at Haytor in Exeter or in Devon? I did remember that because I was bringing up the rear in my usual Gruppetto climbing position. And he beat Quintana, I think, up that hill. You've told me something I didn't know about that. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. From Grand Tours to group rides, the Champs-Élysées to coffee stops... Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Today we are in Monte Vergine. Hello, I'm Lionel Burney and I'm with Daniel Freed. Hello, Lionel. Buonasera. Buonasera. You just heard uh, a few people talking about Simon Yates, who retained the pink jersey on stage eight of the Giro d'Italia. Learned anything? We, we learned a, a fair few things there, didn't we, Lionel? We did. Uh, I was hoping to squeeze in another little fact about Simon Yates, and that is that... That he his w- favourite curry is a piazza. <laughs> is it? Or, uh, or is he more of a Danzac kind of guy? I'm not we'll sure. We'll find out before the end of the Giro. I don't know. I think piazza. Danzac's quite sour. Yeah, he was born on August the 7th, 1992, which was the day before Lance Armstrong rode his first race as a professional, just to put it into context. Not that for those of us who remember Lance Armstrong riding his first race as a professional, the San Sebastian Classic in 1992, which came shortly after the Olympic Games, which was his last race as an amateur. He finished last in that San Sebastian in 92, came back the following year and won it. What an improvement in a year what a that huge was improvement. For, for the young lad. I, I wonder what became of him. Anyway, um, stage eight of the Giro, Daniel. We'll just launch straight into the tale of the tapper. It was from Praia Amare to Montevergine di Mercoliano. How was that? Bad. <laughs> it was bad. Montevergine, 
Di Mercogliano. <laughs> Montevergine. <laughs> yeah. What did I say? <laughs> Montevergine, I don't know, but anyway. Oh. Plenty of time left. You, you're here for another week. Plenty of time to resurrect Lionel Learns Italian. <laughs> 209 kilometers. Um, it was shaped by a break of seven riders Matteo Monteguti of AG2R, David Villela of Astana, Tosh van der Sander of Lotto Fix All, Kun Berman of Lotto NL Jumbo, uh, Mate Mohoric of Bade Merida, Jan Polanch of which Bare team? Bade Which no, team no, is Jan UAE, Polanch in? UAE. Yeah. And we, we had a, a listener complaint. <laughs> last night one of our more illustrious listeners is all Lionel. our listeners are illustrious they're all Daniel. illustrious but is the Bahrain Merida team manager Lionel not director sportive you even called him sports director which is even worse in my book team manager sorry Brent Brent Copeland that is of um, Bahrain Merida correct <laughs> team manager don't want to upset any Kiwis out there <laughs> no, I'm joking I'm joking Brent Copeland is South African. Um, that Maybe that should be the theme. Every corrections corner just commits another error. I don't know. Anyway, the last man in the break, the seventh man in the break, Rodolfo Torres, who kept up Androni's 100% record of getting a rider in every break in this Giro. They were away for a long time with 35 kilometres to go. The gap was still looking fairly healthy, but of course they had to climb to Monte Vergine de Mercoliano. That is much better. And a vast improvement... Similar to Lance Armstrong's improvement pass <laughs> post the 1992 Classico yeah. de San Sebastian. Well, as they approached the bottom of the climb, the rain started to come down. It wasn't as heavy for the riders as it was for us as we were driving across country to the finish. It was absolutely well, torrential at times, wasn't it? It made driving very difficult. We thought if, it, if they'd had to ride through that, I think extreme weather protocol would have been uh, invoked, surely, because you couldn't see. It was coming down so heavily. Um, but the riders escaped the worst of that. With about 15 kilometres to go, van der Sander pushed on a bit. It was fractured a little bit, and they went away and came back together again. And then uh, Bauman split the group with 12 kilometres to go. Monteguti went with him, and then two Slovenians, Mohoric and Polanch, made it a quartet. But the gap was coming down. Mitchelton Scott was setting a really good pace, mostly set by Jack Haig. There was a moment of slight drama in the final few kilometres. Chris Froome slipped and hit the deck, going round a, a, a greasy right-hand bender. A lot of people have said they were looking forward to getting out of the south of Italy, hoping it wouldn't rain in the south of Italy. It makes the roads very slippery. Welt Poles and others waited for Froome, paced him back up, and then Sky was setting a really strong pace on the front, uh, but really the climb wasn't hard enough to do a great deal of damage overall. As you predicted, Daniel, it was a fairly tame... I, th- I think this um, finish in Monte Vergine Mercogliano needs to be parked for a few years. Um, every time the race has gone up there, it's been a fairly tepid spectacle. Um, usually we've seen a bit of a sprint at the end, the sort of puncher, climber type riders winning. That didn't happen today, but there wasn't an awful lot of drama, was there? No, well, there wasn't, but um, Bauman look, was looking really good until about a kilometre and a bit to go. And then we saw Richard Carapaz of Movistar, the best young rider in the race, 24-year-old Ecuadorian. A really impressive attack. Seized the moment, won the stage, first Ecuadorian rider to win a Grand Tour stage. First Ecuadorian rider to ride the Giro. And then uh, we saw Thibaut Pino go for second place. He'd got pipped by Davide Formolo, but still got a four-second time bonus. None of the big names lost any time. Simon Yates is still in pink. Pino leaps over Pozzovivo from fifth to fourth, thanks to that time bonus. And Carapaz climbs from 11th to eighth overall. The points jersey is still with Viviani. The king of the mountains is still Chavez. And the white jersey is still Carapaz. Uh, so it was all about uh, Ecuador's first Grand Tour stage victory today, really, wasn't it? And Chris Froome's fall and his reaction and Team Sky's reaction to that. Yeah, Carapaz has been touted as a as a future star of Grand Tours for a, for a year or two now. Um, he was picked up by Eusebio Unzue, the manager of Movistar, I think on a tip-off from Oscar Sevilla. Remember him, Lionel? I do, I do. What was yes. he doing in 1992? In 1992, I don't know, but in, in the 2000, he was doing quite a lot of doping, I think. Let's move on. Um, yeah, Carapaz has had a good first couple of years at uh, Movistar. Lives in a place called Julio Andrade in Ecuador. Got two children. Um, I don't want to steal... Where, where does he live? In a place called Julio Andrade, which sounds like a, a kind of a, sh- a shady sort of South American agent I rather was, than I was the, say, the place where like a South American lives. Nightclub singer. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> Not very a much singer so. with a limited range of tunes, but uh, a lot of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone sort of raves about yeah, his maturity. I think, we, I think think we might know someone who knows Carapaz quite well. Do we, we not? do. Let's hear from our old friend, our young friend, Fran Reyes, who covers the Vuelta a España with us here on the Cycling Podcast. He phoned in a little dispatch. Greetings from Spain, my dear buddies of the Cycling Podcast. This is your friend, Fran Reyes, talking from Spain. I have been tempted for several days of sending you an audio note, and today I just can't help myself, and I want to tell you how happy I am about the victory of Richard Carapaz today in Montevergine di Mercoiano. As you know, I have the press officer of Equipo Lizarte, which is Movistar sort of feeder team, and we had him in our team back in 2016. We brought him on board because uh, Eusebio Unzue got some kind of recommendation and asked us to take him, and it was a bit hard for him because it was his first spell in Europe abroad far from South America and it was quite hard for him because he had already a son and a wife he had to leave them behind in order to become a professional cyclist but believe me he did his best in order to take advantage of the opportunity he did a super year and above all he surprised us every week by how mature he was. He has been jumping two steps at a time instead of one since he got to Spain, signed for Movistar, did a great year in 2017. And as for this year, well, you saw it with your eyes how powerful he is. He has this great skill of being pretty good at sustaining power, but also having a great acceleration. And he showed it today with that devastating attack who got him the victory. I'm enjoying your coverage of the Giro Italia. Please keep it going. Daniel, Lionel, you are a couple of stars. And the Buffalo as well. So, Fran Reyes, uh, it could stake a claim to having discovered Calapaz, really, uh, I guess, if he rode for his team or the team that that he worked for. It strikes me that, well, it struck me looking at the Movistar team coming here, obviously they are packing their Tour de France team with just about everybody they've got later on in the summer. And uh, he looked at that list initially and thought, well, what are are Movistar going to do here? Um, And they're having a, well, off to a great opening week, stage win and a few days in the white jersey. And suddenly Calapaz could be uh, certainly a top 10 contender. I mean, who knows how he'll go on the really big climbs, but you would imagine that he's not going to be, if if he can cope with Etna and he can cope with today, he's not going to be bad, is he? We need to find out how high Julio Andrade is. Not, I mean, that that again, if if we're thinking of him as a... Of an Ecuador as an Ecuadorian like club singer, that sounds bad. Is he high? <laughs> but we need to know how high the place is. Is he from altitude? But that aside, whether it is or isn't, um, he does have decent pedigree as a climber, and he's very well placed now for the white jersey competition. There will be some challenges. We spoke to Ben O'Connor, didn't we, yesterday? He went pretty well again today. Um, the Yates, well, there's only one Yates here, Simon Yates. Um, he's got bigger fish to fry, and he's also no longer qualified for white jersey competition. So. Carapaz might have a, a relatively clear run in that competition. Yeah, just to recap how he's been getting on this season. Well, he won the Vuelta a Asturias in Spain. Um, l- the end of last month, he was third in the Settimana Copi Bartoli stage race. A bit before that, he was 11th in Paris-Nice, a result that went below the radar a little bit. So he's been uh, he's been performing well all season. Sorry, Lionel, can I correct myself? He yep. won't have a clear run at that competition because Miguel Angel Lopez also still qualifies for that position. Superman Lopez. And he surely has to be the very, very hot favourite. Probably hear a tractor in the background here. We are in the deepest countryside, aren't we? At well, an we're in the middle of, yeah, we're in the middle of the, the vineyards of the Sanio region, or Sanio, which is a uh, sort of sub-region of Campania. Lionel's drinking, well, we were both drinking craft beer. You know, craft beer is really taken off in Italy. This is from um, Ponte here. It's, it's from, from the village, yeah. This huge sort of booming phenomenon in Italy, craft beer. And um, as they are with anything that 
sort of requires taste and sophistication and you know great sort of deftness in mm. in preparing foodstuffs and drinks and um, these hands are very good at making craft beer yeah. but like i berated you earlier for not drinking enough wine that's the first time anyone's ever said that to you <laughs> isn't it well i do i like a i like a podcasting beer if we get the opportunity this is called malta vivo and it's uh i could see this doing really well in london they should be shipping this over to london in boxes and uh, all it needs, it's got a lovely label. All it needs is a half decent marketing campaign behind it, and I think the hipsters will be uh, will be will be going for that. On the subject of food, last night's meal was the Maglia Rosa Virtuale of the Giro, wasn't it? It really was. Yeah, we were pointed in that direction by our hotelier. Um, it must have been a good place because the crew from La Gazzetta dello Sport turned up, yeah, they and they'd also done half a page on. Well, they were told fairly emphatically when they turned up. So this was Ciro, Luca Gialanella, some. Some of those names, or Chiro's name, of course, will be familiar to all listeners. But they turned up very late, about 11 o'clock. They were told in no uncertain terms the restaurant was closed, the kitchen was closed. They then produced the day's Gazetta, opened it <laughs> at the page on which they dedicated half a page to that particular restaurant and the regional specialities, and um, out came the red carpet. It was, uh, it was a nice meal. Let me just find the name of the place. I'm sure I made a note of this. La Rondinella. La Rondinella, and it was in uh, Scalia. Well, what do we have? We had some antipasto, which was it was cheese and ham and artichokes in, in olive oil and, and all of that kind of stuff. Fairly standard, but very nice. And then I had... Kike bacala. No, I had kike, which was... Oh, no, um, with salsiccia, with sausage. Sausage and onion. So the, the pasta were small pieces balls very nice uh, I wonder whether there was a bit of um, whether they were ne- almost like gnocchi with potato in but I'm not sure I, I think they were just pasta those ones and then afterwards we both had uh, the salt cod bacala with chickpeas really was a good meal that's in the pink jersey at the moment as far as the food goes but let's get back to the race because um, as good as our meal was yesterday well Chris Froome had the equivalent of, of dropping his dinner on the floor didn't he a couple of kilometres from the top of the climb mm. coming around that right hand bend uh, it was wet the roads are greasy because obviously it's dry down here a lot of the time and the roads i mean it was a good surface but dust gets on it and then when the rain falls it makes it almost like a well, slippery surface and he was on the white line a lot of other riders were riding around the corner in the middle of the road on the white line but Froom, i don't know what it is he he just everything just went from under him has he got a high center of gravity or something i don't well, know I th- what it is i mean i think he's he's in a run of luck at the moment which is maybe similar to mark cavendish's or mark cavendish's this spring um nothing seems to be going for him i think he's really still suffering to a certain extent from the crash that he um that, that happened in the wreck in israel last week in fact I, I was speaking to people at sky this morning and they said that that crash was probably worse than he or they realized at the time and it's it's taken him a good week and and they sort of are still slightly nervous about you know his form could go either way from here as he recovers from that crash and um, he could either keep getting better or uh, he could really struggle to to find his best form the thing, i think the more thing is he's fallen on the same side again hasn't he i yeah, know it's a smaller a, 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 perhaps a lighter impact crash because it wasn't as quite high speed uh, going uphill but to fall on the same side just as you're kind of getting over the the last week crash um that won't have pleased him and no. when they came back down to the buses at the bottom of the climb having descended in the cold and the damp um there weren't many smiles or happy no. looking faces at the sky bus were no there? there were there were three or four of us there waiting to speak hopefully to Froome and um, nicola portal the direct sportif and yeah they weren't in talkative mood in fact they didn't want to talk at all and um i think Almost more worrying than the crash itself for Sky and Froome will be the fact that in that kind of rush, the sort of stampede in the last 500 metres, um, gaps almost opened up. But the majority of the general classification contenders were at the, at the pointy end of the group that came in together. Froome was sort of among the stragglers to a certain extent. And, you know, we, we, we've seen this many times before and we've seen it a lot this week that he takes a while to sort of, when the pace goes up he sort of takes a while to really find his rhythm Mm -hmm. and you know this kind of he always kind of accelerates on a three or four second delay and you know that might be why he came in 
a bit behind the others. But he didn't look too sprightly and he needs to find his climbing legs quickly because I think tomorrow is going to be a much stiffer challenge. Well, we'll talk about tomorrow in the final part of the podcast. But you're, I, I read the race exactly the same as you do, Daniel. We see every year in the Grand Tours, in the first week, in the first uphill stages, the guys that are on their toes, so to speak, Thibaut Pino, Simon Yates today, you know, looking eager to get over the line as quickly as possible. There are time bonuses on the line and every little bit might help. Thibaut Pino has to be on his toes because one of his top domestiques is affiliated with the Calabrian Mafia. <laughs> we revealed as we that. discussed last night. I'm looking both ways here. We're out of Calabria, <laughs> but uh, we, we need to, we need to be Marabito careful here. Is still in the race. We do need to be careful because uh, there was a lot of interest in that story today, Lionel, from our <laughs> colleagues. And I felt very guilty because I've really opened a sort of a viper's nest and i think there'll be a there, there might have been a queue outside the group armor fdj bus <laughs> this morning of journalists not just journalists who had been on the race but crime reporters oh my word so suddenly the uh, group armor press officer is uh, fielding requests for an interview with steve Maravito. extraordinary stuff but um yeah it was it was a it was a an interesting stage from that respect. You watch the riders come over the line and see who looks good and, and who looks less good. And I completely agree with you. You know, if you're looking at Chris Froome for just a, that little bit of a sign of how well he's going, um, and you know, obviously he'd fallen off not five minutes before, so he's obviously recovering from that. It, it's damage limitation. Get over the line as quickly as possible. But like you say, everything goes right for the people who win Grand Tours, and everything goes wrong for the for the people who don't. And at the moment, Froome is in the latter camp, isn't he? San Francisco. A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Well, Rafa make the wonderful Pedaler de Charme t shirts, which you can buy on the Rafa.cc website or if you want to go to our website, thecyclingpodcast.com forward slash shop. Uh, that will take you straight there, and you can see the jersey, the cap, the T-shirts in the Pedaler de Charme and Pedalers de Charme range. Uh, we opened up the public vote yesterday, and Jack Haig, well, he rode today like someone who is expecting to win the Pedaler de Charme prize, and he has done so with a commanding 48%. I'm going to resist a Brexit joke here. 48% won on this occasion. Enough for a victory on this occasion for Jack Haig. So I will go and find him tomorrow and present him with his Pedaler de Charme jersey. What are we doing? I want to show you something, Lionel. But this isn't anywhere near the Giro. Oh no, we're off the route. But get out the car. But it's it's raining. Get out. Oh, I don't like... I don't. On, on. Yeah. I don't like in charge, Daniel. I've brought you, Lionel, to the Zonkalan. Oh, no, even I know this isn't the Zonkalan. It's the Zonkalan of the south. We're at the foot. We're in a place called Calvanico. This is well, the, the climb that we can see in front of us that you're about to describe. The mountain where you're about to describe is where the Zonkalan of the south um, begins its journey. I would describe it, but it's shrouded in cloud at the moment. How much higher does it go than there? I mean, it looks it looks quite mountainous, but it doesn't look as um, impressive as uh, mountains in the north, I wouldn't say. We're in the Monte Picentini, um, so we're just to the east of Salerno, not far from Naples. And, um, well, the, the climb we're talking about goes up to just over a 1,000 metres above sea level. Well, it's nothing like the Zonkalan then, is it? Well, it's, n- it's nothing like the, the Zonkalan, but it's also nothing like what was advertised, mythologised, speculated about. Um, in 2011, there were a series of newspaper reports, and the story was broken on an internet newspaper called Info Oggi, but then um, it subsequently went on to appear in Tutto Sport, in various cycling magazines, Il Mattino, a local newspaper, that the 2012 Giro was going to feature the Zonkalan of the south and that was the Rifugio Calvanico. The problem was that the climb they were talking about was was 7.8 kilometers long, um, 13% average. It was going to be the hardest climb ever to feature in a Grand Tour. However, it didn't exist. Or it didn't exist 
in the form that people thought existed in it existed in there was a facebook group started there were letters sent to the local mayor of, of calvanico there was a, a mischievous grin from the then giro um, boss Angelo Zomanian when the Rifugio Calvanico in the Zoncalan of the South was mentioned and everyone was ready for it to be unveiled at the 2012 Giro route presentation but it wasn't. I actually came up here not long after that to try and investigate um, I was writing a book called Mountain High I wanted to know what this Rifugio Calvanico was I spent about a day here asking for directions, asking people what this climb was, where it was, and it turned out it didn't really exist. Something vaguely similar existed. It was a climb to a santuario, a religious sanctuary of uh, San Michele, Pizzo di San Michele, um, but it was not as high as people thought it was. It was not quite as steep, and it was in no condition to, to host uh, even a village kermesse, let alone the Giro d'Italia. So let me get this straight. It's not an average percentage of 13%. It's not 7.8%. It was 11%. It's, and I actually did climb it on a bike, but it was um, about 7 kilometers long, 11% average. But, um, yeah, it's never going to appear in the Giro. So did we get to the bottom of why this story even existed? Was it some kind of uh, internet myth or, or somebody... A bit like when people post completely made-up transfer rumours on football forums and then it dis- then it appears in the sun and it turns out that the player doesn't even exist. Is it <laughs> Correct. similar it was to that? exactly that. It was an internet-based whispering campaign. Mauro Venue, who is now the Giro boss but was then the, the Giro route director, I spoke to him about the Rifugio Calvanico and the Zoncalan in the south and he says that there are 60 million people in Italy and 60 million people who want to design a Giro route. Um, they all think it's, it's like they all want to be the Italian football team manager. They all think they know the best team. He says he, he gets thousands of suggestions for climbs to use and, and dozens of people have claimed that they've found the Zoncalan of the south or the east of the west. Um, and, and that was one of, um, it was a case like that. I imagine whoever invented this uh, mountain and started this story probably felt quite satisfied when it pitched up in national newspapers and magazines. I know, And, and a book, and, and four, four pages were dedicated to it in a book called Mountain Higher. Yeah, but you were debunking the myth rather than going, going along with it. I mean, it's something the Cycling Podcast tried years ago when starting the rumour that Geraint Thomas was going to join BMC. <laughs> We've started lots of those rumours. <laughs> Covering the Giro with you, Daniel, it's a, it's a magical mystery tour. I never quite know what's happening. You just said, oh, we'll just take a little deviation. I didn't really know what was going on. And, and, and I came, uh, came out, of, out of it having learned something. Although I, did, I had a recollection of that, having read it, in your, read it in your book a few years ago. So, but I wasn't aware of exactly where the, the fake Zoncalan was. Well, actually, when we came off the uh, Monte Vergine di Mon- Mercogliano, climb today we came down a different side stumbled a bit there didn't you on the pronunciation yeah <laughs> almost almost um we we sort of well we we came down a way that intersects with the race route about um two-thirds of the way up and it was it was very steep actually and it made me wonder why the Giro organization has not used that road before and it was in pretty decent condition so very uh, narrow though wasn't it but it was quite narrow um but you know there are there are a lot of climbs in this part of the world. In yeah, you know, it's very mountainous. This is the the Apennines, Lionel. But you know, sub there are sub ranges of the Apennines. We were in one today, the Monte Picentini. The the Giro organization over the years has tended to well, we've tended to be in the south in the first part of the race, and they've wanted a fairly sort of gentle summit finish or a gentle mountain stage as the first mountain stage. So we've we've been to uh, Monte Vergine and Mercogliano a few times, and uh, Monte Sirino or climbs like that but it would be nice to see something really gnarly and nasty in the south of Italy and I think you know the the fans would really get excited about that as we saw I mean there was a uh, tens of thousands of signatures in this campaign to have the the so-called Zoncalan of the Sud included the, of the Sud of the south sorry I do love this idea of uh, fans creating a news story getting it in the papers and and getting a sense of legitimacy before you know anyone's had a chance to check out whether the climb actually existed well it's amazing, it, really. i've noticed that in the in the vuelta in particular there's a fantastic community of of sort of forum posters what do you call people who, who post on forums forum posters. forum posters people um people internet people 
Remember, when, yeah, forum people, as Mark Cavendish used to call them, that post online. There are various. I'm not. I can't remember all of their names, but who post on on forums, particularly in Spain, um, suggesting climbs, and um, some of them. Well, I, I had to trawl these forums when writing my books about mountains. But some of them have ended up in the in the Vuelta, and there have been some real gems that have been discovered purely purely by punters, fans local cyclists who know that there's an absolute beast of a climb somewhere that would be great in a bike race but uh, on a similar vein i'm going to try and popularize a nickname i've come up with for simon yates berry born simon yates now if you are um interested in food as i am as everyone knows after no. the last couple of days no. <laughs> um, i mean uh, i'm partial to a bit of black pudding uh, or boudinois as they call it Get in out. france they have a version in in spain as well um uh, it, it's uh, for those who don't know, perhaps listening further afield, who who don't have this delight, this delicacy, it, it's made from pig's blood and fat. Uh, it's a sausage. A, a black pudding is a is a sausage. What do, you, what do you make of Il Corriere de las Heras saying today that Thibaut Pinot was as rich as a recipe for foie gras? I didn't get that at all. No, well, no, no. But I'm gonna I'm gonna make this nickname. I'm gonna get this in Gazeta somehow by or one of the other papers by the end. Um, Simon Yates is from Berry, of course. I'm not sure he eats an awful lot of black pudding by the looks of him. I don't don't think there's a great deal of body fat on him. He probably doesn't sit down to too many plates of it. But uh, the Italian version of black pudding is called sanguinaccio. So uh, I'm going to start calling Simon Yates Sanguinaccio Volante, the flying black pudding, and see if we can get that into popular parlance in the Italian press. What do you think my chances are? Do you think um, they, the Italians go for that kind of thing? They're, they're oh, the king yeah, of the nicknames, they, Oh, they absolutely they? love the nick, nickname. I think we'd get it going. Let's get it. Let's mention it to Chiro. Sanguinaccio <laughs> Volante, the flying black yeah, pudding. Yeah, yeah, I think Chiro will go for that. Chiro was incredibly excited. Oh, I, purely um, the, the, the fact that... Simon Yates and Adam Yates were, were were big aficionados and lovers of Indian food. Got Chira very very excited this morning. <laughs> he that will be in the. I guarantee that will be in the Gazette tomorrow. He wants to come to. He probably wants to come to uh, our events at the end of the year and uh, and and sample some of the curries that the Yates brothers themselves enjoy. Well, right? well we should point out, Lionel, that our ten facts ended up being well, and it was eight facts in the end about Simon Yates, wasn't it? Um, that was really inspired by. <laughs> by us noticing how much La Gazzetta and the Italian press are struggling for information about Simon Yates and struggling for colour. So much so that La Gazzetta listed... Well, the, the best thing they could come up with yesterday... or what, When did he take the pink jersey? Was it yesterday? A couple of days ago. A couple of days ago was that he liked watching TV. Yeah, it reminds me of those uh, football magazines in the 80s when I was growing up doing interviews with the players, the question and answers, you know, hobbies, you know, reading, driving, watching TV. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, there's the, that's the thing, isn't it? They they are quite opaque in that sense. They don't give a lot away on or off the bike, really. I mean, that's part of... Like the, video games as well. Right, well, you know, I mean... Don't know which one. Well, maybe we should make that our mission to find out. But um, I think there's something in that. They're not showy, are they, in that sense? And I think... Uh, uh, well, we will find out a lot more about Simon Yates as the race goes on, particularly if he keeps the pink jersey. But uh, Daniel, this morning, uh, you, did he speak to anybody else? I did. George Bennett. Always a pleasure to speak to George Bennett, certainly one of the more expansive riders um, in the peloton at the moment. And he's had a very good first week of the Giro. Um, he's riding high on general classification. Lionel, do you have the general classification I there? Do. Can you tell me exactly where he, he is on general classification? Oh, no, I've just closed it He down. is ninth on general classification. He is, because I'm, I think he's I would gone suggest down a place as a result of Calapaz. Oh, well, in, in that case, he'll be 10th. Yeah. He'll be 10th. Um, however, he's looked like one of the best climbers in the race. Um, he's looked, over the past year, to be one of the best climbers in the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's quite absurd exciting to just observe from afar this sort of journey of self-discovery that that he seems to be on and um i sort of asked him about that course that he's on and that trajectory this morning and in the last sort of 12 months 18 months you really seem to have kind of entered a different dimension as a rider are you sort of gaining confidence with every mountain stage really that you're doing at the moment so far it's been really good i mean this year's been super consistent always top 10 and people keep asking me if i'm surprised or something but actually not anymore you know after the vuelta when i was 10th I think last year was another big step up in the tour especially, but had a bit of bad luck getting sick the last half of the year. But, I mean, this year's been another, I, I like to think, another step up, but it's it's hard to know, you know, because, like, you can't compare numbers with numbers because it was different climbs, it was different leading to the climbs. But if I look just at the results, I think, uh, you know, I feel like I'm 
there and competitive and, and not really happy with 10th place anymore. With most guys, there's they have a set of expectations and then the staff and their team have a set of expectations for them and often they don't match up. Either the rider thinks he's better than they think <laughs> he is or the other way around. How is it in your case? I, th- I really think this team has a lot of faith in me. They really believe in me and, uh, you know, sometimes I think I'm better than than I am and, and, and other times they think I'm better than I am and or, or you know, better than I think I am. It, it works well because they keep me in check but they also give me a lot of confidence and uh, put a team behind me and... and the thing is, the expectations. I don't really, I don't really actually care that much about if it goes wrong. I mean, I do. I'm really disappointed for myself, but I do it for myself and for my friends and my family and things like that. And it's not that I feel this pressure that I have to do it because the director of Lotto Jumbo, you know, it, it's it's more a, an internal sort of thing as opposed to external pressure. You're lucky to have that mentality. Not every guy does. <laughs> I think for sure, and you see it in the way some guys ride. You know, in the when the team's giving them heat in the press and all that stuff, it's never a good thing. And yeah, if it doesn't work out, I mean, they, what can you do? You know, it's a bike race. He's always great value, isn't he, George Bennett? He's always got something interesting to say. A couple of, well, one dynamite quote in uh, the episode from Mount Etna when I spoke to him that morning. Uh, go back and listen to that if you missed it. Um, but we were saying we were following the Team Lotto NL Jumbo bus yesterday, weren't we, as we were driving up the course. And they've got the names of the riders all on the back, as all the buses do. They They... Um, have uh, all the names of the riders on on the bus and it struggled to get a handle on what that team actually is I mean it's Dutch at its heart but it's got some uh, quite interesting foreign riders and you wonder they, they're split a little bit here with um, Van Poppel sprinting um, but they're off to an absolute flyer really with Bataline winning the stage a few days ago and uh, Bennett in the top 10 and climbing well and looking very good on Etna and today Bauman riding extremely well out of the break and kind of uh, well, he, he had a, a half a chance at the end. He just faded at the crucial point. But um, they're a team that are punching above their weight here and, and tend to do so. I mean, bag more wins than perhaps you would think from the, the riders that they've got on their roster. So our question this week for Science and Sport is from Chris Holyfield in North Wales. Hi guys, love the podcast. Thanks Chris, I'll not read the rest the, the rest of that because uh, it's a bit flattering. Uh, I have a question for Science and Sport. As a larger rider who wants to shift a fair few pounds, what's the best way to lose weight but still stay fueled on a ride? Is there a form of nutrition that particularly suits this? A negative energy balance is essential uh, to shifting weight. You can achieve this by burning more calories in training or consuming fewer calories in the form of food. A bit of both normally works well, so you need to do some long rides, probably two or three hours long, uh, will help you burn quite a lot of calories, especially fat. And then some short, intense sessions, even 30 minutes of intervals, will produce a high calorie burn during the ride and also a sustained calorie burn after the ride because your metabolic rate will be increased. If you delay your fueling for the first hour of your ride, it'll help generate a negative energy balance you'll still need to take on board some carbs though because if you don't take any fuel on board during the ride the intensity will drop and the calorie burn will go down some of the ideal things to take would be a science in sport gel for example an energy bar or some go electrolyte drink to help maintain hydration during the ride as well replacing some of the high gi carbohydrates with vegetables so if we replace for example the potatoes or rice or pasta you might have on your plate in the evening meal with some uh, spinach or broccoli then that will help you stay full without consuming too many calories the cycling podcast is supported by science in sport independent research shows 10 percent of sports nutrition products which get a professional rider banned trust science in sport the world's highest standard of banned substance testing Thank you to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. If you want to get 25% off all Science and Sport products, go to scienceandsport.com and when you check out, enter the code SISCP25. Um, that was a listener's question. It was answered by one of Science and Sport's experts and uh, we'll be playing a few more of those as uh, I think one a week as the Giro goes on and then uh, that, that series will continue. Um, while I'm just doing a a little bit of plugging and various other things this is a last call for anyone who wants to call our whatsapp number uh, with a question for our uh, debut show where we'll be answering listeners questions on the rest day well, our riders do press conferences on rest day so we thought we should answer some questions as well you know 
Yeah, well, the question came flooding in uh, uh, at this request. Yeah, there's a telephone number to leave us a WhatsApp message. It's WhatsApp, so if you're on Wi-Fi, it doesn't cost you anything. Plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two zero five. And if you go to our Twitter page at cycling underscore podcast, the number is actually in our biography there as well. If you didn't catch that, or you can just scroll back a few seconds and and make a note of the number. Leave us a question about anything. Our Giro coverage, or well, yeah, it's got to stick to the Giro for now, uh, if you can. Uh, any aspects of our Giro coverage so far or what might come up in um, the week and we'll answer those as many as we can on Monday and we'll put that out hopefully on Monday evening also Friends of the Podcast episodes that you can listen to Kilometre Zero is for Friends of the Podcast at this Giro if you want to sign up and listen to those it's uh, thecyclingpodcast.com forward slash friends it's £15 to sign up for 2018 and you'll get loads of episodes Um, Kilometre Zero we've done three so far one on the, the start in Israel, then one looking at Sicily, and uh, what was Friday's one, Daniel? I've forgotten already. Well, uh, sorry, Lionel, I was distracted there. What, what Kilometre was zero on Friday. Friday was the little fish. The little fish. The pesholino. Of course, yeah. Find out who's the little fish. You might be able to guess that if you haven't listened already. And we've got another Kilometre Zero coming up on Monday. Um, another Friends of the Podcast episode that came out at the start of the year was Lunch with Matt White, the Uh, Mitchelton Scott, sports director. You've probably heard a little bit about him uh, on this podcast during the Giro because, of course, he is the boss of Simon Yates' team. Always good value, always has something interesting to say. Fascinating lunch. He talked about his own experiences riding the Giro back in the kind of Wild West days. And lastly, um, don't forget that there's a chance to win some Rafa and Science in Sport swag by retweeting tonight's episode. Um, just go on to our Twitter page at cycling underscore podcast uh, retweet and add a short comment stating why you listen to the cycling podcast use the hashtag Giro 101 our first winner was at Beardo underscore L who's won a limited edition Rafa Gavia hat styled on the iconic piece worn by Andy Hampston uh, who basically won the Giro in 1988 um, by riding very well in the snow on the Gavia you can find the full Gavia collection on Rafa's website will have We'll announce more winners on the next rest day, uh, and you can enter as many times as you want throughout the Giro. I mean, can't say fairer than that. Just just join in and uh, win some stuff. Uh, now, this morning, Daniel, I went to the Katusha bus to talk to the British rider Alex Dowsett, I think riding the Giro for the first time since 2013, when, of course, he won that, that huge 60 kilometre. We don't want mistakes, Lionel, in tonight's episode. I don't want to be sitting here with you tomorrow having to make corrections <laughs> um alex dowsett did ride the 2013 giro because uh, he won that time trial stage didn't he uh, upset the apple cart when bradley wiggins was was going to go and uh win the giro coming off the back of of the tour de france i'm actually just double checking that look now, it up he lionel he look hasn't ri- hasn't ridden the giro check, double since. check check again Hasn't ridden the Giro since. So he's riding the Giro for the first time since 2013. Anyway, last night after the stage finish in Praia Amare, he tweeted uh, his dit- dissatisfaction. And as I just say that, the floodlight in our courtyard here has just come on as if it's listening to us. But he tweeted about the danger posed by the unlit tunnel. Um, or tunnels on the run-in and the one that caused particular consternation was with around seven kilometers to go when the race was really on it was kind of slightly downhill as well um, on the run-in to the finish on the seafront and um, well this is what he said about the the danger and difficulty that that tunnel posed Alex can you describe your experience riding through the tunnels yesterday because you tweeted something to say that it's not really on to have unlit tunnels so close to the finish yeah it's frightening it's possibly the most scared I've been on a bike. I certainly wasn't the only one. I mean, anyone that's a cyclist, just imagine riding in a group and then shutting your eyes for 15 seconds on the wheel of someone in front of you. Just, you just can't see a thing. You don't know what anyone else around you is doing. It just shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have been in the race. <laughs> you imagine just switching the lights off in a Formula 1 race. Was it completely dark in there? Or was it lit in any way? Well, it was about four candles. <laughs> There's a couple of like token flames at the side of the road, but yeah, couldn't see a thing. Could not see anything. You've raced in Italy a lot before. The Giro is known, I guess. They were, well, racing in Italy, they do have unlit tunnels. It, it's the issue that it was so close to the finish when the race is really on. I think there just shouldn't be unlit tunnels generally on a course. We don't have lights. <laughs> on a climb, it's perhaps talking about a question of risk here. We're, 
risking ourselves all the time when we're racing. At the end of the day, we have we have a helmet, and that's all we have to protect ourselves. And we're reaching speeds of 40, 50 mile an hour. But if there's any stretches that can be made to make our environment as safe as possible, then they need to be taken. And yesterday was just careless. And lastly on that, what was it like actually in that tunnel? Was there shouting? I mean, what can you do to try and make sure you don't hit the rider in front of you? I don't think there was any shouting. I just think everyone was possibly in the same boat. For me personally, all I did was I quickly thought that if I was to brake, someone would hit me from behind. I certainly didn't want to accelerate in case someone in front of me was braking. Just tried to stay in a straight line. Tried not to make any sort of movements left, right, forwards or backwards, and in the hope that everyone else sort of did the same. I still had a half a mind I had on the race, kind of went out the window for that tunnel. Probably the same case with everyone. And the amount of risk that we have to take at times and you know, the organisers that put these races on and try and sometimes make it as epic as possible, but sometimes at the expense of us. And times like that, we look out for each other. Unfortunately, what, what's it going to take? Was it, would it have been better yesterday if someone had had a huge crash and... They really injured themselves for the organisers to actually take notice. We get an apology afterwards and it's like, oh, sorry. And it's like, well, what's to stop that happening again? What's to stop, you know, we've got tunnels today. Like, are they going to put floodlights in there? Or are they just going to put eight candles instead of four? Well, Daniel, I think you can hear in Alex Dowsett's voice not just the frustration but kind of controlled anger about um, the situation the riders were put in yesterday. Should make clear... Dowsett wasn't the only person to tweet something or be unhappy about the uh, position the riders were put in. I did try to suggest, was it was it more troubling because it came at a point of the race where everybody was, you know, trying to move up and, you know, so close to the finish? And he made the valid point that really an unlit tunnel or a very badly lit tunnel um, has no place in the race. And I think it's, you know, it, it's something that we see not just in, in Italy, but we do see in other countries races go through tunnels that are, that are poorly lit and well, the riders have to take you know have to basically hold their breath and hope for the best and we remarked didn't we in the car on the journey today Lionel that this Giro d'Italia so far has had a, a slightly retro feel about it in the sense that if you go back and read newspaper reports or books about the Giro's of the 60s and, and 70s um, you know there was all sorts of, of kind of skullduggery intrigue shambolic organisation and you know between the, the transfer from Israel to Sicily and then the um, the boat trips that we heard about yesterday and then yesterday, for example, um, on the stage to Praia Mare, um, about 20 kilometers from the finish, the peloton went through a town called Diamante Diamond and the, while everyone was out of their houses at the roadside watching the Giro go past, two armed robbers were smashing their way into the post office in Diamante and stealing 14,000 euros. Then we've got Steve Morabito's Calabrian Mafia collections. Um, collections, connections. It's, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a shock. In an age when the Giro over the past few years has become... I mean, it's, it's retained most of its charm, but it's becoming more and more sort of sanitised, more international uh, more sort of polished um certainly in a way that it wasn't yeah. 15 or 20 years ago but um i would say the image is polished but the reality when you get up close i mean it is fairly shambolic you know the starts and the finishes you know the signposting for you know the the, the race vehicles is not necessarily the best and remember the team buses and so on have to follow um those directions yeah quite a shambles at the parking this morning at the start but unlit tunnels when riders are hitting 50 miles an hour or 75 80 kilometers an hour i mean really that is a fairly simple one to solve isn't it some generators and some some floodlights i mean it can't be difficult it's kind of a, a symbol of almost neglect really and i don't think it is acceptable i don't think it, it's on really you know when we were in sicily and the country is gradually improving as we move further north um, but there's definitely a sense that the south has been forgotten and it, it, it did make me think when we drove up Mount Etna the way we went up the road surface has been improved I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of euros that would have cost to resurface that road but well Lionel some of the press buffets I think the budget for some of our press buffets in in Sicily dwarfed what some of the local councils have spent on their roads yeah. and so forth in the last year i mean this, these the opulent <laughs> banquets that we've been treated to <laughs> but the thing is with you know I, I don't want to be kind of flippant about it but the the race needs good road surfaces of course but does etna, mount etna need a good road surface for the general population and it's that that balance of 
bringing the race to a region to show off that region. But what is going to be the long-term effects? And I suppose that's one of the things about sport in the 21st century, the disparity between the, the money that is available at the very, very top for um, for the athletes. And when you think of the money that, that the riders are being offered to take part, and, and if uh, my information is correct, you know, seven figures for Team Sky slash Chris Froome. I'm not quite sure how that breaks down, but that's a lot of money to... Uh, attract them to the start i believe naira quintana was paid a similar amount last year to come you know so money is available um and then when it comes to the actual race itself um it doesn't seem to be available or at least if the money is available it's not being spent in the right place but you know that's something i think alex's point at the very end there was you know they get an every time this happens they get an apology and are sorry and then what what happens nothing really uh, the same thing happens again the next time they go through a tunnel but there we go. That that's maybe something for the riders to the riders union to pick up at um, and and take to the UCI. Tomorrow we're going to Gran Sasso d'Italia. Impromptu Italian lesson. What does Gran Sasso mean? Any ideas? Uh, big, big rock. Big rock. The big rock of Italy. We've been up oh. there a few times with the Giro. Famously in 1999, Marco mm. Pantani won in the snow. Is it a big? table shaped rock uh, shape, ish. It? it kind of looks like a bit of an like an anvil do you know what an anvil yeah, looks yeah, yeah. like yeah um very spectacular they call it there's a huge plateau at the top very beautiful where the race finishes um tomorrow that they call it's known as the piccolo tibet the small tibet um because it looks like high plateaus in tibet i'm led to believe however the most important event in the history of the uh, Gran Sasso d'Italia and Campo Imperatore, where we finished yesterday, was the liberation of Mussolini. Do you know what happened? I don't. So Mussolini was arrested, um, obviously towards the back end of the Second World War, 19, in July 1943. Adolf Hitler, not a friend of the podcast. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> well, it, I'd, I'd have to check well, all the email well, addresses. <laughs> <laughs> he, he began plotting to, to free, to liberate his fellow fascist, Benito Mussolini, didn't know where he was. Um, one of Hitler's secret agents located Mussolini in Sardinia, Sardinia um, tried to rescue him there, it didn't work. Mussolini was then moved and messages were intercepted over the airways and he was located at Campo Imperatore, where we're finishing tomorrow. Mm. Um, Hitler dispatched his one of his top SS um, Luftwaffe pilots, um, Otto Sc- um, Scorzani, to Campo Imperatore, landed, um, freed Mussolini, and took him back to Berlin via Rome, I think. How does that relate to the bike race? Well, well it doesn't do relate expect, to the bike race. What but do we expect on Grand Well, Sasso? I don't expect anyone to be liberated and taken <laughs> back to Berlin. Maybe I'll be liberated from the Giro and taken <laughs> and take back, back home to Berlin. To Berlin. Well, um, leave, what do we expect leave, from the Giro? The yeah. last, well, it's a very long climb. Um, have we got the Gar- Garibaldi in front of us? Why haven't we got the Garibaldi? Oh, um, it's, 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 I left it in the toilet. It's if, over. <laughs> if you listen to the Kilometer Zero a few days ago, you'll well, get the, that the, the Well, the significant portion of the Gran Sasso d'Italia climb, the Campo Imperatore climb, is the last last two three kilometers where the having sort of oscillated between about four and six percent for most of the climb it then goes up to about eight or nine or ten in 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 places and that's where Pantani attacked in 1999 that's where we think there'll be a bit of a GC sort out tomorrow Giuseppe Martinelli we mentioned him yesterday the Astana direct sportif the most successful direct sportif in recent history of the Giro he thinks that even from six or seven kilometers to go there could be some big attacks tomorrow so um, the, the, the will be there will be changes on GC interesting so much harder than today much harder than and it's today. a long stage isn't it it's two the longest stage of the race two two nine or two three nine kilometers it's uh it's gonna be uh, well it's gonna be a long day w- will the weather will there be rain again is that what weather forecast? is um weather is forecast Rain is forecast. Rain is forecast. Well, it's the last day before the rest day as well, and that you know, there's always a little bit more uh, eagerness to, um, well, knowing that there's a there's a day to recover. We might see some uh, might see some action on the final climb, and we will bring that to you tomorrow evening in the cycling podcast from the Giro d'Italia. And until then. We're off to... What are we going to drink tonight? We're going to drink wine. We're going to drink... Uh, Falangina is the famous white mm. wine from around here. Um, very much acclaimed in recent years, This the, the um, Falangina produced in this specific region. But we're going to go red tonight. We're going to have some Alianico, I think. Okay. Well, 
um, I'm looking forward to whatever they're serving. Um, I think it's a sort of fixed menu here, isn't it? So we will go and see what it is. We'll report back and see whether it captured the Mayo, uh, Mayo? Malia Rosa Virtuel. I mean, that's mangling. You said that. That's mangling. Virtuel's not an Italian word. No, I said, did, did you not say Malia Rosa Virtuale? The listeners can decide. Anyway, until tomorrow. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Ci gira dalla tenevo giardina che la raccolgo